Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Stephen Sacker. The Chinese Communist Party is pumping out a relentless stream of propaganda to celebrate the centenary of its formation next month. In a sense, it is a triumph of creative thinking. China's modern day economic miracle was engineered when Mao's communist orthodoxy was abandoned. The party exercises authoritarian control in the name of stability rather than ideological purity. My guest is Victor Gao, party loyalist and one-time translator for Deng Xiaoping. How sustainable is the party's grip on China? Victor Gao in Beijing, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you very much for having me. It is the 100th anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party. Would you agree that perhaps that's more a recognition of the party's devotion to raw power than it is to ideological purity? Well, I think China is celebrating the centenary of the founding of the Communist Party of China, the biggest, largest, most important political party ever in human history with almost 100 million party members. And the party is indeed invasive. It's omnipotent and uh, uh, omnipresent. However, I would say if any political force anywhere in the world really has some justification to be very proud of its achievements, it is the Communist Party of China. It has very solid track records. And I think this celebration is not only celebrating the Communist Party of China, but also the great transformation that China has gone through over the past 42 or 43 years in particular, or ever since 1949. This is not celebrating of the power grip. This is truly a good occasion for everyone to celebrate why we are the Chinese today mm. and why we believe tomorrow will be better than today. You used an interesting word there. You described the party as omnipotent. Do you think it is healthy in any society to have a political organization that is, your word, omnipotent? Well, I would say societies everywhere in the world are different. And uh, China, given its own historical background, its own history and its own culture, now to have this Communist Party of China as the omnipotent power in China, very uh, much present everywhere you go, and very much in the driver's seat, mobilizing the people, pointing out the direction of movement for the whole nation. I think this is the right time for the Communist Party to be the leader for the whole Chinese nation. And, and we all benefit from the great achievements and we are very proud of the leadership of the Communist Party of China. And uh, there you sit in Beijing. And of course, you and your family are just uh, one family of many hundreds of millions across China who are exposed to the constant, as I put it earlier, stream of propaganda in film and signs on buses everywhere across the country. There is this message that the Chinese Communist Party has generated generations of heroes that you all must be proud of and think of at this time of the centenary. Is that kind of propaganda necessary and helpful? Well, first of all, propaganda as a word in English or in the Western world has some bad connotation to it. In China, I would say we are very proud of the achievements and we do not need propaganda as you uh, use that word for. Uh, for spreading around the message. And I would say the Chinese people, especially for the past few years, have seen with their own eyes the differences between China as we are and all the differences in other countries in dealing with the pandemic, for example. And we are very proud of the solid track records. And we are very proud that the Communist Party of China is really caring for the people, saving as many people as possible, people as old as in their 90s rather than abandoning any other people and doing their best, mobilizing the whole nation 
in preventing right. people from getting infected by the virus. I suppose the point of propaganda is that it is a, a deliberate and systematic effort to create a, a narrative. It, it might be a narrative that bears little relation to reality. It might actually be myth-making. So I'm just wondering what role there is for honesty right now in China, honesty about the past of the Communist Party, Omini uh, honesty about what happened under Mao Zedong, what happened to millions and millions of Chinese who were starved to death, who lost their lives during the famine, during the quote-unquote great leap forward. Is there room for honesty? Well, this is exactly why I have some problem when you use the word propaganda in English, because the celebrations we are doing today for the achievements of the Communist Party of China or China as a nation, for example, are really telling the real stories. And these real stories are actually not fully told by many of the Western medias. Now, if we compare China today with 1949 and with 1978, when I started to go to college and preparing for my work for Deng Xiaoping, for example, in the 1980s, I would say China has completely transformed itself from today compared with 1949 and ever since 1948. Of course, for a nation with China's size, every day we make some mistakes. We do not need to be proud of our mistakes, but we need to celebrate our great achievements. I would say no country ever since 1948 has made as much progress economically and politically as China has. The but, Chinese but, but, nation but the, point, the, point, <laughs> the point is that much of that progress didn't start in 48. Mao's rule over China was in many ways catastrophic. That story is not being told right now. And what you refer to as the great economic miracle of China, that really didn't begin until after Mao's death, when your boss, Deng Xiaoping, took over and said that getting rich could be glorious and put a whole new spin on what China's political and economic system should do for its people. That's the truth, but nobody's telling it in Xi Jinping's China today. Allow me to disagree uh, with your narrative. Uh, we know for sure between 1949 to 1978, major mistakes were made, especially during the great cultural revolutions between 1976 to 1976. Huge losses were made, and eventually China was locked up in a huge ideological box. We were debating that everything socialist must be good, must be superior to anything capitalist. So eventually we ended up on the wrong side of history because our economy was stuck and mm. our productivity was slowed down. However, even in the first part of the Chinese history, in uh, ever since 1949, China did make pro great progress. The living standards were improving, industrialization was striking deep roots, and don't forget, China developed the nuclear bomb and the launch missiles and launched the satellite into the orbit. All these achievements were made under Mao Zedong. So, I think it's inaccurate to say that during the first two decades or so, China did not make great progress. And I would say by wiping the whole slate clean, it prepared for China's resurgence ever since 1978. As you reflect on the centenary, will you also find room to remember the thousands of your fellow citizens murdered by the Chinese military under the instruction of the Chinese Communist Party in June 1989 at Tiananmen Square? Well, I would say uh, whatever happened in 1989 has taught the Chinese nation as a whole that China today cannot afford to have a revolution. Whatever problems there are in the society, we need to deal with them in a very scientific way, in a very peaceful way, rioting or violence or revolutions aimed at color change, for example, or regime change is not tolerated in China. I would say, whatever the reason for the events in 1989... What, 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 hang on, Mr. Gale, what, what, those, whole, what those thousands of protesters in the streets of your capital city in 1989 wanted was more freedom, more 
democracy. Uh, are you telling me that freedom and democracy are ideas that cannot be entertained in China in 2021? I disagree. I would say the real position in China is without democracy, you cannot have modernization. We all want to have democracy. We all want to have human rights. But democracy, as defined in Britain, for example, may be very different from democracy defined in China. And human rights in the United States may be very different from the human rights in China. For example, we do not consider gun ownership as part of the human rights. We consider all those deaths from the gun violence in the United States as a deprivation of the people's fundamental rights of life. And we cannot allow private ownership of guns that no, doesn't but, mean that but, but Mr. Gao, you're not, you're not really addressing my central point about freedom and, and democracy, because what we see on this 100th anniversary is that the Chinese Communist Party has found ways, ideological contortions, to enable the people of China to get rich, to make money, to enjoy many of the fruits of a capitalist system. What they have not allowed the Chinese people at all is any degree of political freedom, any real ability to freely express themselves, to express dissent against the ruling party. Are you telling me that that total disconnect between economic freedom and political intellectual freedom is sustainable for the long term? First of all, Stephen, allow me to disagree with your analysis. Uh, uh, first of all, I think the system in China works for China today under the Chinese circumstances. Secondly, but, I would uh, say Mr. Gao, it, it, it only it. works if you're prepared to see all of those who dissent locked up, repressed, surveilled, robbed of what we in the West call basic human rights. Allow me to disagree with you again. Why? Because I would say any society everywhere in the world today has some taboo list. It may differ from one country to another. But don't tell me that there is any country that you have freedom of speech in absolute term rather than conditional term, where you have freedom of uh, expression without any conditions to it. No, I would say freedom or human rights all exist, not in the vacuum, but relative to rights and obligations. In China, we have our own freedom, we have our own democracy. It's conditioned to circumstances in China. And in China, there is a short list of red button issues you are not allowed to talk about. For example, Tibet independence, Xinjiang independence, or Hong Kong independence. For example, if anyone wants to declare Hong Kong as a republic of Hong Kong, it will be wiped out immediately. It's not part of the freedom of democracy as we understand in China. But you cannot say that the rest of the system in China is not freedom or human rights. I would make one point. Without empowering the people, you cannot change China from a very backward country to the second largest economy in the world today. And also, don't forget, the Chinese economy is larger than that of the United States today if you use purchasing power parity. Mm. So we are talking about but, revolutionary changes. All right. But the thing is... Don't deny that China has its inner qualities and strengths that maybe some Western countries fail to fully understand. The, the real fact is, and we have this from databases and research done by independent human rights groups, that thousands upon thousands of Chinese citizens are currently being detained under a, what is called a residential surveillance at desi designated location system, which because uh, of their views and expressions which are not satisfactory for the Communist Party government, they are now in effect detained in isolation. And that might happen to you if you express dissent. So how, how do I know that you're speaking from your heart? Stephen, let me tell you one thing for sure. I'm speaking with you now from the bottom of my heart. I'm a man of decency. I'm a man of honesty and high level of credibility. But you're and a, a man who's living also... in, a, in a severely and increasingly repressive system. Do you not acknowledge that? No, I disagree. I would say China is the largest internet society. There are more people using smartphone or internet connections in China 
than any other country in the world. Do you really believe that the Chinese people using their smartphone or internet connections without doing lots of chatting, for example? But, and excuse me, Mr. Gao, but, 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 but we know for sure that the Chinese government has one of the most repressive monitoring systems of the internet in the entire world. You yourself have a social credit score, which is based upon your performance, your expression online and in your public and daily life. And that credit score affects everything about your life. We also know that if you went to your television in a different room in your house right now and tried to watch BBC World News, you wouldn't be able to because the Chinese government has blocked it. This is the reality of the government that you live with today. I actually highly respect the BBC and I talk to your BBC colleagues quite a lot, probably more often than any other people in China. However, the censorship of BBC is not because of the contents of BBC, it's because the British government uh, closed down CGTN in London first. And the closure of BBC in China is a retaliation against the wrong decision of the British government. And I want to say this to you. I want to do whatever I can to restore BBC to mm. normal operation in China. If, for example, you can reciprocate by allowing the normal operation of CGTN in Britain. This is this will make both China and Britain better. Right. Let me ask you a, a, a personal question of, of opinion. Uh, Xi Jinping engineered the uh, removal of term limits. Back in the early 1980s, the Communist Party thought it wise, certainly given the experience under Mao Zedong, thought it wise to impose a two-term limit on the presidency. Xi Jinping, just a couple of years ago, engineered its removal. Personally speaking, do you think that was a mistake? Allow me to make this point. Uh, even if President Xi Jinping served in his leadership position all the way up to 2035, Xi Jinping by then, by 2035, would be younger than Deng Xiaoping, for whom I worked as his interpreter. Yeah, in I'd just like a direct answer to the question. Do you think the removal of term limits was a mistake? My answer to your question, Stephen, is that China now needs a very strong, powerful leader who sees where China is and why China needs to stand firm on matters of principle on the global stage and refuse to cave in to whatever pressure coming from Washington. This is the leader we need, and Xi Jinping is indeed this kind of leadership that China is very much embracing right now. Much of the pressure that China faces right now isn't actually coming just from the United States. It's coming from the entire international community and indeed from the United Nations as well. I'm just looking at the most recent UN Human Rights Council uh, report. Grave concern about the human rights situation in Xinjiang. Uh, there are allegations that uh, the Uyghur minority over many years now has faced uh, by the hundreds of thousands, internment in detention camps, that women have been sexually abused in detention, that many Uyghurs have been forcibly transported out of the area to work elsewhere in China. These allegations backed by video and photographic evidence and data uh, that has been leaked from China. Are you prepared, again, because of the way in which you say that you don't have a problem with the, the way speech is, is uh, controlled in China, are you prepared to tell me that that is fundamentally wrong and you want it to change? With due respect to you, Stephen, allow me to say I believe you are fundamentally wrong. Why? Because the United States or the Five I countries or some European countries, they cannot really be bold enough to say that they represent the totality of the international community. And every year at the United Nations Human Rights Council, whatever vote bad-mouthing about China, let's say up to about 25, 35, 40 member states, should be outvoted by another resolution sponsored by more than 90 countries. So I would say whatever you believe is the truth is not the universal truth, that the international community all embraces. Well, if For you... Xinjiang, I remember we talked about Xinjiang. Allow me to say, Xinjiang is part of China. It will remain part of China for thousands of years and longer in, uh, to come. And the Uyghur brothers and sisters are part of our national fabric. No one can change these two megatrends involving Xinjiang. 
I will go to Xinjiang next month. I will be very proud in hopefully reporting to you and BBC colleagues about what I see with my own eyes, with my own conscience about the realities in Xinjiang. Because I really believe people in Xinjiang of so many different ethnic groups, they benefit from stability and development and their living standards are improving and they do not buy all these fabrications about the bad situations in Xinjiang. Why? Because they are not true. Mm. That's the fundamental point about Xinjiang. Now, when we get to Hong Kong, you have said to me that everybody who faces any sort of government action, repressive action in Hong Kong, is a supporter of independence and a Hong Kong republic. That patently is not true. There are many activists who simply want the one country, two systems principle to be recognized. And they believe that the national security law imposed from Beijing fundamentally undermines that system. I'm mindful, for example, of Jimmy Lai, the pro-democracy activist, but also the editor of the newspaper Apple Daily that's effectively been forced out of action because of repression from the Hong Kong authorities backed by Beijing. Can you not see that, again, this undermines any claim China has to respect human rights and freedom of expression? Stephen Apple Daly was calling for United States government to penalize Hong Kong, to take away many rights of the people of Hong Kong from the Hong Kong SR government. Whatever Apple Daly did, is not exercise of freedom of expression or freedom of press. It is actually sedition. And I don't think any country will allow its newspaper to call on another foreign country to send in troops to Hong Kong to remove the Hong Kong SR government, to overthrow the Hong Kong SR government, and to drive the PRC central government away from Hong Kong, which is part of Hong Kong, part of China. So I would say, Let's call a spade a spade. There are political forces in Hong Kong which for many years deny that Hong Kong is part of China. They want to return Hong Kong back to the British, which is impossible. They want to return Hong Kong to the, Brit to the Americans. They wave American flags in the streets of Hong yeah. Kong. They try to raise the tensions between China and the United States. And there are forces in the United States which fueled these right. friends. Victor, so, Victor Gao, we're Spain almost out of time. You've lived through many different uh, eras in your life in China. Do you b really believe that the Chinese Communist Party's way of ruling right now, people around the world see it as deeply repressive, systematically repressive? Is that sustainable for another 100 years? Truly, I believe it will be for another 100 years and longer. Why? Because if there is any political party anywhere in the world, if there is any political party in Britain which has made as much solid records, improved the living standards for the people of their constituencies, for example, as the Chinese Communist Party has done for the Chinese people, they will be in office. They will not be voted out of office. They probably will be exactly the ruling party as the Communist Party of China is in China. Right. So. I think people, there are eyes, and they can make their own judgment. And the Chinese people know that the Communist Party of China has brought about change for the better for the Chinese people. Victor if they can keep doing this, we want to keep them in office. Victor Gao, we have to end there, but I thank you very much indeed for joining me on Hard Talk. Thank you very much.